So there comes a time in every person's life where they have to take a look in the mirror and say, Crystal Beasts, it's not bad. What's up Ocean, you got Matt here and welcome to another amazing Yu-Gi-Oh! video. We all know Crystal Beasts, it's an underwhelming archetype, but it's an anime favorite with a ton of support. It's a mid-range deck that uses its control tools to really win the game that way, with powerful cards like Crystal Conclave, Crystal Miracle, and of course Rainbow Bridge of the Hearts. It's also an incredibly budget deck. You can buy basically the entire core of this deck minus the staples and hand traps for about $15 to $20 at the most. And if you guys want more budget decks, then you can take a look at the video up over here. That being said, today I'm bringing you the best Crystal Beast deck profile for the May 2023 competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! format. And this video can reach 60 likes and we can hit 500 subscribers. I'll give you a nice combo guide with test hands for this strategy. Now, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump on into it. All right, everyone, let's go ahead and jump on into the deck profile portion of the video. And it is going to be a good one. Starting off with the best main deck monster in the deck is going to be Three copies of Crystal Beast Sapphire Pegasus. This card is so incredibly important for the strategy. Without it, it really doesn't do much. It gets you so much advantage because on summon, normal, special, flip, whatever, it allows you to place a Crystal Beast monster from your deck, graveyard, hand into your spell and trap zone, which is really good. It is a one card rank four for that reason and a one card link two for it as well. And it is not a once per turn, which is crazy. Most of the time, you're going to be going ahead and getting the, the cards you're getting from your deck, rather, to put into your spell and trap zone is going to be a copy of Crystal Beast Rainbow Dragon, aka Zenith, as Neshi would say. Honestly, this card is so strong for the deck. Having access to a way to basically, for cost, banish it from your spell and trap zone to be able to special summon from your deck while negating its effect, a level 4 or lower Crystal Beast monster is crazy, but you can also add a Rainbow Dragon from your deck to your hand, which is so incredibly powerful because this strategy relies on having Rainbow Dragon in your hand to be able to activate powerful spell cards like Awakening of the Crystal Overlords. Such an amazing card to have access to, and you want to make sure that you have it as often as you can, so playing three copies of this is great, but on top of that, if your Crystal Beast monster would battle a card, you can use this card to be able to special summon it from your hand for free. Such an amazing card, and it is a level 8 for rank 8 plays. I think that 3 copies is correct. 2, I would have said it would have been perfect in tier limits format, but 3 copies right now because of Kashtira, potentially banishing them. You really don't want that to happen at all. Next up is going to be our 1 as We have the 1 of Crystal Beast Cobalt Eagle, we have the 1 of Crystal Beast Ruby Carbuncle, and we have the 1 of Rainbow Dragon. These cards are mandatory to play. Cobalt Eagle is another level 4, it is a wind in case of lightning Chidori plays, it is also got a decent body at 1400. Ruby Carbuncle is fantastic because it allows you to swarm the field, getting a, getting a way to summon this card from the deck, spell and trap zone, graveyard, whatever, to then spell from the rest of the monsters in your back row is so good. You get so much card advantage by having these cards on the field, and you get ways to swarm the field, go into powerful extra deck monsters, and even just win the game with your powerful spells and traps that rely on having crystal beast monsters on the field or in the spell and trap zone. Such a good card. And Rainbow Dragon, I mentioned it before, you need to have this card to be able to activate some really powerful spells and traps in the deck, so I do think it is an absolute must of play in this strategy, even though it is a massive, massive Garnet. Next up is going to be our spells. This is it for the Crystal Beast monsters in the strategy. Only nine of them, very few. But next is going to be our spells, like I said, starting off with three copies of Rainbow Bridge. I won't spend too long on this. It is basically a card that allows you to add any crystal spell or trap from your deck to your hand. Very powerful to be able to get access to a lot of your spells and traps. I think it's all of them, but like one or two of them that get access to the, well, that you can get access to through this card, which is very, very nice. We then have one card that you cannot get access to, but it is the best card in the deck, in my opinion, being three copies of Rainbow Bridge of the Cart. This card essentially gives you three really relevant and valuable effects. The first one is going to be, you get an extra normal summon of a Crystal Beast monster. Awesome, that's fantastic. Second effect is going to be that during your main phase, you can destroy a Crystal Beast card in you that you control or in your hand to be able to search for a Crystal spell or trap from your deck. Really, really powerful because if you have a monster that's in your main deck monster or main monster zone rather, you can use the card, destroy it, put it in your spell and trap zone and then get the, will not lose any card advantage. You get a plus one off of that. On top of that, with Rainbow to the Heart, this the third effect is going to be if a card is placed into your spell and trap zone, or if a Crystal Beast rather is put into your spell and trap zone, even during the damage step, you can target one card your opponent controls, return that card and this card to your hand. So you're not losing any advantage, you're basically getting a plus one on your opponent because they're losing a card and you're keeping a card. It's really 
really powerful and just allows so much presence for your field. Such an amazing card to have access to. You really use this card often and you abuse it quite a lot. Next is going to be three copies of Awakening of the Crystal Ultimates. I think I call it Awakening of the Crystal Overlords before. That's my bad. This card is really strong. It has two really nice effects. You have to reveal a Rainbow Dragon or essentially, actually I should rephrase. You have to reveal an ultimate crystal monster, which Rainbow Dragon always is, to be able to use this effect. If you control an ultimate crystal monster, you can use both of them. But in this case, you're never going to do that. It's just not going to happen. So we use one of the two effects. The first one it was going to be that you can take a Rainbow Bridge card or a Rainbow Refraction from your deck and either add it to your hand or send it to the graveyard. Now that's really good to get access to your Rainbow Bridge, your Rainbow Bridge of the Hearth, and your Rainbow Bridge of Salvation. There's a ton of really good options for those cards here. Another awesome effect for this card is you can special summon from your deck, graveyard, hand, or spell and trap zone a Crystal Beast monster to your side of the field, which is great because you can get this card to go into Ruby Carbuncle and then special summon your entire back row, which is really, really strong to be able to overwhelm your opponent with the cards that you have access to. Just an amazing card, and it is a quick play. It is so fantastic. Next is going to be two copies of Crystal Bond. This card is great. It is essentially a road up for the archetype while also putting a, spell or a Crystal Beast monster with a different name in your spell and trap zone. So that's obviously fantastic. Getting access to your Sapphire Pegasus in hand is great. Getting access to your Zenith, your Crystal Beast Rainbow Dragon in your spell and trap zone without committing to a normal summon is great. Why do we only play two though? It can be a little bricky. If we see this card multiple times or late in the game, it's just a brick because we don't pay very many Crystal Beast monsters. So it just doesn't make much sense to have more than two of them in my mind. Honestly, you could get away with playing just one, but then you kind of lose to Ash, which really does suck. So keep that in mind. Next up though is going to be two copies of Foolish Burial Goods. This card is great. Having access to a card that can get your Rainbow Bridge of Salvation into the graveyard is valuable. You want that card in the graveyard as soon as possible because of what it gets you to your side of the field. Next up is going to be three copies of the namesake of the deck. This deck is called Crystal Conclave Control because of Crystal Conclave. This card is fantastic. That's two really solid effects. The first one is going to be that if a Crystal Beast monster, if a face of Crystal Beast monster, I should say, would be destroyed by a battle or card effect, you can special summon a Crystal Beast monster from your deck. Really strong there. Also, you can send this card from your face of field to the graveyard, then target a Crystal Beast card you control and one card on the field and return them to the hand really strong and you can stack them onto multiple copies of itself. The issue is you can't use both effects of Crystal Conclave in the same chain, so keep that in mind. Next up though is going to be another a really awesome Crystal Spell and Trap, that's going to be Crystal Miracle. This is the counter trap for the deck, it is an Omni Negate, which is fantastic. Negating spells and traps and monster effects is great. You destroy a Crystal Beast card you control and if you do negate that activation and if you do destroy that card, it has a second effect in the graveyard that can get you another Crystal Beast monster from your graveyard or into your, or your um, hand or deck into your Spell and Trap zone, which is really nice but doesn't come up as often as you would think it does. Next up though is going to be the reason we play the Foolish Burial Goods in the Rainbow Bridge of Salvation and the Necro Valley. This card here is mandatory to play. I know it looks very shiny. It is a $1, $1.50 card. That's it. It does not come in the structured deck, but it is so, so strong. If this card is in the graveyard, you can basically take this card and you can send the, uh, you can, well, you can take this card, banish it, I should say, then you can add any Crystal Beast monster from your deck to your hand and any field spell from your deck to your hand. So incredibly good to have access to basically your entire deck through a card like Foolish Burial Goods, which is a one card combo to get you to your Field Spell in Necro Valley, your Sapphire Pegasus, which is a one card combo to get you to your rank four, your link two, whatever it might be, get your engine rolling, which is so, so strong. We then have our, our hand traps and our non-engine cards. We have 11 non-engine cards in this deck right now, starting off with three copies of Droll and Lockbird. This card is so valuable. It is the best hand trap in the format right now, period. It is so incredibly good at what it does, shutting down any searching, which can shut down so many different strategies. It can shut down Kashtira. It can shut down Super Heavy Samurai. It can shut down Branded. There's a lot of good things that this card can do. You have to play it in your main deck, in my opinion. Next up is going to be two copies of Dimension Shifter. Now, I can play three. I'm not going to. The third is in the side deck, and the reason for that is because this card is really good against a lot of strategies. It's really bad against Kashtira. So I'm not going to play three copies and I'm hoping that I see it against non cashier decks. I'm hoping that I do see it. Sorry, let me rephrase. I hope I do see it against non cashier decks and if I don't see it against Kashtira. And I can side accordingly if I need to side it out. I will. If I need to side one other one in, I will. We have options. This deck can play under the Dimension Shifter decently well. Next up though is going to be our Kaiju. We have the one Gamma Seal as well as two copies of Godarla. 
Now, I would play another Gamma Seal if I could. I think three Kaijus in this strategy is correct. I do like the idea of mixing Kaijus. That's just a big fan of mine. I, I like that a lot. And uh, like I said, I'd play a, third, a second Gamma Seal if I could, if I had one. But for now, I'm really happy with this, uh, this layout here. It's a really strong layout, very good in the strategies. And again, also really solid because both these cards are, both these monsters are level eights, not level sevens, which is great for Kashdira. And then finally, we have three copies of Dark Ruler No More. I need to have a way to be able to deal with the super heavy samurai boards. Them putting up like Barone plus Appaloosa is really, really annoying. So having access to Dark Ruler is just a way to kind of shut that down, then just go off ourselves. And I do be able to just beat our opponent in terms of raw advantage that way, which can be possible. So keep that in mind, it is a very strong inclusion in the main deck. And we can only side it out if we absolutely need to. So that's going to be it for the main deck, 41 cards. Let's go ahead and jump on into the extra deck. As for the extra deck, it is a very heavy rank four toolbox based strategy. So starting off with the most important rank fours, we're going to look at the one copy of Baguska, the Terrible Tire Tapir. It is such an important card for the strategy, such a really good, powerful card for what this deck wants to do. You have to play it in the strategy. We then have Time to Redoer, which I think is super underrated in this format, being able to draw a card if it has a spell card as material, or be able to bounce a card if it has a trap as material. We then have the one copy of Dugaris the Timeless, which is good to get cards like Rainbow Ridge of Salvation into your graveyard if you happen to draw it, but also getting access to two additional draws that way, which is really strong. I think Abyss Dweller makes a lot of sense if you're going up against a graveyard-based matchup and you don't really have ways to get to Necro Valley, so it is very, very strong. We then have Gaga Ga Cowboy for time purposes, Digesto Emerald to be able to recycle cards that are in our graveyard, which can happen in this strategy, and then Tornado Dragon as our final rank four, as with a solid rank four option. I'll be honest, if you have Lightning Chidori, play it instead of this. I just don't have it. So I have an alternative, which will be Tornado Dragon. Next up though, we have our rank eight being our Dingirsu. There are other options for rank eights. I would say that Hope Harginger, the Titanic uh, Galaxy Dragon, whichever one that is, is a really solid card because it's a spell negate, but it also allows you to basically uh, redirect attacks, which is very strong. So keep that in mind. I just think that Dingirsu is a bit better right now. And then finally, of course, we have the one Zeus. You really want to have Zeus if you can. If you have two of them, play two of them. I do not. I will play the one for now. Now for our links, we have the one copy of Lingaribo to be able to link off the Nightmare Ibli, which is going to be very important. We then have the one copy of Nightmare Phoenix, the one copy of IP Mascarena, and the one copy of Nightmare Unicorn. Back removal is really nice. Mascarena for interruption to go into Nightmare Unicorn is very strong as well. So we have those two copies. And finally, we have our Link 4 and Link 5. We have our Link 4 in Boral Sword Dragon. If you have Axis Code Talker, just play Axis Code. If you don't, Boral Sword is a great and low cost alternative. And then finally, we have the one copy of the Underworld Goddess of the Closed World. Fantastic card that you can use to suck up your opponent's board, especially if they have like an Appaloosa on field. It is very, very powerful. Just a great card to have access to. I think this extra deck, while it is not tight, it is not too loose either. You want to have a lot of the cards in this extra deck, but you have options to kind of play around with it. So just go ahead and do that. See what you like. I don't use most of these cards. Most of the time I'm using cards that are in my main deck to be able to win games that way. So just look at the look at the strategy that you have in your main. And this, this extra deck should be for utility purpose mostly. So again, keep that in mind. Let's go ahead and jump into our side deck now and show off what we have for different matchups. Starting off the side deck, we have some Kashdira hate in three copies of a Book of Eclipse. This card here is very strong against Kashdira. If we have our spells and traps blocked off, it makes it very hard for us to play the game. So having access to Book of Eclipse to shut that down is obviously very powerful. Not good against every strategy, but good against Kashdira. Next is going to be two copies of Nibiru, the Primal Being. We definitely want to have access to Nibiru. I would love to play a third, but I don't think it's as good in this format as we expect it to be. It's better against Rogue, and this deck, you know, is rogue, but I really want to show the power of Nibiru. The fact that it has access to a way to just destroy your opponent's entire field is really strong and can really just swing games that shouldn't be really swingable or really capable for you to win because you have access to Nibiru on your side of the field. And then finally, we have, well not finally, but next up we have the third copy of Dimension Shifter in the side deck. We'll add it in if we need to. We'll take out the other two if we need to. And then moving on, we have three copies of Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit. Really good in this format and can definitely see a lot of play going first and going second against a lot of different strategies. You definitely want to have access to this card when you're playing like Super Heavy Samurai or any card that relies on like uh, any deck that relies on like a field spell. So that is going to be Ghost Ogre. We then have three copies of Evenly Matched. I think this card is still so, so good. Having access to ways to clear boards, force negations is really powerful. You just have to play it in your extra deck right now, in my opinion, or your side deck rather. It is so so strong. And then the last cards we're going to be playing is going to be our spell and trap removal, the one Cosmic Cyclone, the second Cosmic Cyclone, and of course the one Harpy's Feather Duster. Now, this deck is, I have to clarify, it is not a top tier deck, okay? It's not. 
we know that Crystal Beast is more of a budget deck, a rogue deck, but still a fun deck to play. A lot of my buddies and I at local, we got together, we played a bad deck night, quote unquote, and it was a lot of fun. I brought Crystal Beast, had a blast with it, and because of that, I want to show you guys what I decided to bring for that for that tournament. So with all that being said, I want to thank you guys so much for watching the video. If you guys did enjoy it, then do me a favor and smash the like button because if you guys hit 60 likes on the video, as well as help us reach 500 subscribers, which we are super close to, I will bring you guys a nice combo guide as well as test hands for this deck because this deck, it's not a very linear game plan. You really got to play smart with it. So if you guys want to see that, make sure to leave a like, comment as well what your thoughts are on the deck profile, what things you would do differently as well. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to the channel. But did you know that only 3% of you guys are sub to the channel? So if you guys are enjoying the content, then do me a favor and smash the like button and of course subscribe as well. Thanks so much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you all next time.